Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning, church. Welcome to those online as well. Hello to you. I'll be preaching with my mic in hand today. I've been having a little coughing going on, as you know, for a few weeks now. And of course, I did the whole COVID testing, all that stuff, and was negative. I just am getting old, I guess. And old winter, old man winter just doesn't like me anymore and gets in my lungs and all of a sudden I start coughing. So I'm going to hold my mic in hand so I can mute if I need to today. But it's so great to be in worship with you uh, and great to come to the Lord again and, and just hear from the Lord through Scripture. And of course, Scripture is such a blessed thing. And uh, that Lord speaks through us and through us, and hopefully today you will be challenged once again to grow closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't been with us, I just want to let you know we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, and we've made it to chapter 8. So every week we've been looking at a new chapter. So your challenge this week is to read chapter 9 on your own, and uh, every chapter is not that very long, and so you can easily do that multiple times this week, wrestle with it in Scripture, ask questions, and even go online to our Facebook discussion page. It's just Groveport UMC Discussions. If you type that into Facebook, you'll find it. You can join it. It's an open group. And we'll have some dialogue there and some ways to, to interact with the uh, material that's found in Chapter 9 this week. I do want to mention to you, uh, also if you haven't been with us, no worries, but every week we'll be coming together on Sunday and hearing just a portion of that chapter uh, as a sermon for that week. So hopefully, maybe if you did have some questions, hopefully they will get uh, addressed or at least talked about in some way during that day. As we come to Mark chapter 8, let's first of all start with prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Mark chapter 8 is uh, another jam-packed full of great things going on, and so the, the story of Jesus continues. And uh, if you've never really sat down and read the Gospels in one sitting before, or at least you know, intentionally read through uh, one of the books. One of the things that may surprise you about the story of Jesus is the feeding of the 5,000 kind of happens twice. And in fact, uh, there's a feeding of the 4,000 that is a little less famous, because uh, I guess, you know, less numbers, less famous, right? But actually, it happens again in chapter 8. Uh, we've already had the feeding of the 5,000 in previous chapters, and, and the feeding of the 4,000 takes place. And it's so similar, right? And, and what happens is, Jesus is there with a bunch of people, and actually this time they've been with him days, it says, and it, he even tells his disciples, I'm going to have compassion on these people. And so he ends up, they, they look around and they get the bread that they have. They only have seven loaves, and they have just a few small fish Jesus digs up as well, and so they split this and do the same thing, basically, that they did before. And what's important about that is the story that happens right after this is Jesus you know, leaves the people, he gets in a boat, goes across, Gets to the other side. The Pharisees come and challenge him. He decides, you know what, we're going to get a boat and go back. So he gets in the boat, goes back, and on the way back, they haven't had time to go to the store or do anything. The disciples only have one loaf of bread with them left to eat. And, you know, they're going to get hungry with all, you know, 12 plus Jesus of them and, you know, in the boat. And so Jesus starts warning them about the, the yeast of the Pharisees and beware of it and, and also of Herod. And the disciples look at each other. You know, they got food on their brain, right? And so they hear about yeast and they associate it with bread and they go, oh, well, Jesus is kind of like, he's scolding us because he only got one loaf of bread in here, right? And, and it's kind of funny because uh, it seems so odd to us that they make that assumption because, you know, the context doesn't really, you know, Jesus just hashing it out with the Pharisees seems to originate the context that it would not mean something, you know, figurative like that, that it literally means what Jesus says. But it's so telling that the disciples, in a culture that's very much more indirect than ours, where Jesus, they assume that Jesus is pointing out their mistake. And Jesus is very clear with them, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> if you read it, it kind of comes like, 
hey, just stop. Whatever interior d dialogue you got going on in yourself about your inadequacies, just stop. Listen to what I'm telling you. I am not talking about bread. Look, I fed the 5,000. I fed the 4,000. I'll take you one loaf. I'll make all the bread we need. Don't worry about it. Listen to what I'm talking about. I'm talking to the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Beware of it, right? And so Jesus sets them on a, on a path there. Then there's a great story of Jesus healing a blind man. And, and uh, I've always wished we had the name of this person that was the blind man because uh, not too many people get to say that Jesus spit in their eye. But this man gets spit by Jesus in his eye. Then his hands get placed upon him and he becomes able to see and, of course, rejoices in the Lord. And I've always wondered if he, if he was named character, like how many of us would name our children after this man, you know? And then there'd have to be some correlation in their life with spitting. You know, like there'd have to be Mr. Spitter or something. I don't know. But it, maybe we would have renamed the idea of spitting to that person's name or something. But anyway, so as he heals this man. And there's the story that I wanted to really talk about today, this quick story that's told in the other Gospels as well. But it's so telling what, hap what happens. Now just think, we're in chapter 8. So Jesus and the disciples have been together for a while. Lots of ministries happen. Lots of healings happen. Miracles have happened. Demon possession has been thrown out. People have come and, you know, great healings have taken place. It's been just an amazing time. Lots of teaching has happened. Lots of, you know, even calming the storm, if you will, and all those type of things have taken place. But Jesus ends up in a place you wouldn't think Jesus would end up. And, and it's real easy. The, the Bible sort of takes for granted sometimes that we know where these places are, the things that are associated with them. But Jesus goes to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, we've got to pause here because we don't know anything about that place. You know, for us, it's just somewhere on a dot on a map, and who knows. This is a really interesting place. This is very northern Israel of today. And if you go to Israel, you'd be surprised. There's actually a mountain at the northern part of it called Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is actually snow-capped year-round. You don't think of Israel, you don't think of hot desert, but actually it's got a whole bunch of diverse uh, climates and, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Environments, if you will, all around it. And we get to the northern part, you got big, tall mountains and ice and it melts and there's these big, huge streams and all these uh, springs, if you will. And it's a really beautiful place. In fact, uh, you know, when I look at my, back at my pictures of going to Israel, it's pretty clear. You can look at like southern Israel, it looks like the desert, like true desert. You go to like uh, Jerusalem, it's supposed to be the land of milk and honey, it looks like a bunch of rocks, right? <laughs> and a couple like shrubs. And then you go up to the north of the Sea of Galilee, and it's like the rolling hills and, and kind of like, you know, looks all beautiful. And you go further north, it actually gets more beautiful and it's got like the mountains with the beautiful water and the big trees and all these giant streams. And you think, why in the world would anybody go to Jerusalem? Like, go live in the north, right? Like, it's, it's a much, much prettier place. Uh, of course, throughout history, uh, there's been a lot of deforestation and, and great empires that came and have, have conquered and used a lot of the wood for sieges and things and just burn stuff just to burn stuff. It's changed a lot that's over there that we see today. But nonetheless, you go to the north, and you can still get the feeling of what this place was like. And of course, the ancient peoples, whenever they found great springs and great trees, a lot of times attributed places of worship to them. And Caesarea Philippi has this great big spring at the base of Mount Hermon, and there's a cave there, a beautiful, beautiful, huge cave. And when you go there, they still have it. You can see the structures today. It was built to be a worship place for the god Pan. There might have been some things before that for the local deities before Greece came in and conquered. But even when Jesus was around, there's literally the god Pan is being worshipped here. And the shrine to him is here. And this ancient city that used to exist that no longer does is, is here. So Jesus is really in territory that's owned by the pagans. This is one of the few times Jesus goes outside truly of the Jewish or Samaritan even populations. And is somewhere where... He's in Rome, right? This is Roman-occupied, pagan territory, pagan worship, all these different things. And at the base of this great mountain, where the god Pan is being worshipped, Jesus finally looks at his disciples and he asks them this question. Who do you say that I am? 
mean, stop and think about this point of the story. It seems kind of odd. I mean, the disciples have been with Jesus for a while, seen lots of things, and been with them through thick and thin. Yet Jesus takes this moment at this pagan shrine, away from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in front of the almighty power of Rome, if you will, the place itself where it shouldn't belong, right, in Jerusalem and, and the surrounding areas. And Jesus looks at them and says, Who do you say that I am? Before he says that, he actually asks them this question. He asks them, who do the people say that I am? And of course, they start sharing you know, the easy question. Well, there's some say you're John the Baptist, you know, risen again. And some say you're Elijah that's come back. Other people just say that you're one of the prophets. But Jesus gets to that question. Who do you say that I am? We'll get to it the answer that Peter gives in just a moment. But it's so telling that Jesus sometimes stops and wants to look at his followers and ask each of us that question. Not, who does the world say I am? Not, what do you intellectually believe about me? But who do you say that I am? In fact, if you're sitting here at home or wherever you may be and hearing of this, if just pause for a moment and just put on your, your, your adventurous caps, if you will, and your, your thinking caps, if you will, and your imagination caps. Just imagine that right here in the service, it just pauses, right? Time just stops. And Jesus walks in, and I don't care what, you, what he looks like to you. It doesn't matter because you just know it's Jesus. Whoever, whatever he looks like in your brain, just go with it. Jesus walks in, comes and sits next to you you directly in the eye and ask you, who do you say that I am? One of those questions you, you can't beat around the bush, can you? I mean, you, you, you can't fake it, right? I mean, the Almighty God is sitting in front of you, looking you in the eye, asking you, who do you say that I am? And of course, part of the hard part of that is you can intellectually say all day that, oh yeah, Jesus is the Son of God, or Jesus is God, and all these different things, but the moment you're sitting face to face with them, and he asks you, who do you say I am? And you say, you're so-and-so. It all of a sudden reflects upon your life. You've got to act like Jesus is so-and-so, right? And of course, the answer to this matters in our life so greatly. It affects every single aspect of our life. Look at Jesus. There's so many answers that could be given. He could be the hero he could be the villain. He could be the savior. He could be the worst thing to come upon this world in your life. He could be grace. Or he could be justice. He could be just a man. Or he could be the Messiah. He could be a prophet. Or he could be the prophet. He could be a great teacher. Or he could be the biggest fool to ever live. But your answer matters. Because when Jesus asks it, and asks it of us, there comes action with the answer. You can't avoid it. And if you give an answer like Peter does, and like the disciples do, your life goes in a certain direction. Your actions, sort of the way Scripture talks about it, is your faith is justified by its works. That there's an action that comes because of the faith you have in this person. And the whole course of our life becomes different. Now Peter, of course, in this moment, tells Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, you are the Messiah. Or actually, he says technically, he says the Greek term, he says, you are the Christ, which... Christ is another, is the Greek word for Messiah, which is the Jewish word for the anointed one. So Peter right here says, Jesus, you're the anointed one. And when he says that, he's not just saying you're an anointed one, like there's a bunch of you running around out there, right? You're the one that is promised. You are the one. You are the one that Scripture's talked about. You're the one we've been waiting for. You are everything that we've been waiting for, and I put all my trust in you. So Jesus, of course, hears this. But it's so telling to look not only at the Gospel of Mark, but the other Gospels. It's so telling that when you go to the Gospel of Matthew, the same story is told, but Peter's answer is actually a little different. It goes a little further. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is 
asked the same question, the same story, same setting, all these different things, but Peter gives this answer. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's so weird and it's so funny to me, and I'd love to know, like, go back and, and talk to the original author of Mark, you know, why or why not Mark chose to remember that. And it is very interesting because when you think of the Gospel of Mark, tradition tells us that Mark was written basically by John Mark, or at least is the people that John Mark was associated with. And part of the understanding of John Mark is he was associated with the disciples and walking around with them, but especially Peter, right? And so I don't know if this is kind of a, a lesson in humbleness for Peter, that he doesn't, you know, he gives his answer, but he doesn't give the full answer or something. But this is the Gospel of Peter, so you would think Peter would tell he said in this moment that Jesus was the Son of God, that he would go on and say that as well. But it's so telling that Jesus hears that he's the Christ. And whether or not Peter in this moment says that you're the Son of God, or did or didn't, or how that worked exactly. But nonetheless, Peter had this moment, you are the Messiah. You are the one we've waited for. Whether or not he really understood Jesus as Son of God at this moment, we don't know exactly the way Gospel of Mark tells it, in Matthew it definitely appears that way, but in the Gospel of Mark it seems like it's a hidden mystery that keeps getting unfolded. And in fact, we look at how the Gospel of Mark is structured, it makes a lot of sense with the ending because the Gospel of Mark is constantly trying to get you to ask the question of who is Jesus? You, the reader. So I wonder if part of the writing of Mark is just he didn't want to tell the rest of Peter's answer just because he wanted you and I to wrestle. But Jesus is the Messiah, but is he more than that too? It's like the Gospel of Matthew would allude to, and the rest of Mark, really, the stories of Jesus alludes to, that he's asking us, and we're constantly in dialogue and debating and wondering, who is this Jesus through this book? But it's so telling that Jesus always asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And as you think about your own life, you know, many of us have been, you know, quite honestly, there's, a, there's an ability to live as a Christian and avoid that response to Jesus. And to avoid that question. But you can't. See, you can go through all the motions, and you can grow up in the church, or you can attend certain Bible studies, or you can read Scripture and all that stuff, and it is perfectly capable to always keep it this arm distance of, this is a story about Jesus and disciples, and yes, I believe it, but keep it at arm's distance from you. But at some point, you've got to meet with Jesus. You've got to answer his question to you. Who do you say that I am? Of course, for many of these people, when they finally come to that point of their life where they have to answer that question, it's sort of that life-changing moment in their life. It's, it's that altar call moment, if you will. It's that Billy Graham crusade, you know, where their life is given to the Lord. But I wanted to say to you, as I've grown older in my wisdom and being a pastor and seeing the faith of many people and understanding it, there's so many ways that God asks us that in our life. And for you, you know, for some people, they remember a day, right, or a moment where their life was radically changed. In fact, I've told you my story before. On August 11th, 1996, I can remember the day, remember the night, Unicoi State Park on a retreat of a youth group that I didn't want to go on but was forced to go on, and I ended up saying yes and going on it, and met with the Lord that night. I've told you that story before. I won't tell you to you again, but uh, at least here now. But there was, an, you know, a moment where Jesus, I had to encounter him. My life did the 180, the 90 degree turn, if you will. <laughs> Fully changed the rest of my life. But for sure, that's not the only way it happened. Right? That God not only uses you know, moments like that or altar calls, if you will, not only uses things in our life like crises where people come to know the Lord deeper and in a better way where they understand the Lord more fully, and truly it changes their life. Or maybe they go on a retreat or something a spiritual formation event like walk to Emmaus or something like that. But it is totally also possible to grow up in the faith. And so one of the things as I come to these verses and think about the faith that is displayed here in, in the story of Jesus, one of the things that I always want to be pastoral about is to understand that you can grow up in the faith. And maybe you don't remember this moment where Jesus, you had to encounter him and decide. It's just been something that's always been before you. It's something that you've always in your life chosen to continue in what you were taught because your parents or people in your life or your grandparents or someone in your life taught you about serving the Lord. 
So when Jesus comes and asks you this question, who do you say? I mean, it's just easy because, well, you're the Lord. It's always been, always been that way, Lord. I don't even know anything different. And that's the hallelujah, right? Because that's really truly how it's supposed to be, that this faith is passed on and passed on and passed on. And that those that receive it continue in it. That they would ever grow up always knowing the Lord. But nonetheless, even that aspect, at some point you had to choose to continue in it or not. At some point you were given the opportunity to rebel and go off on your own way and you didn't choose it. Because you sat with the Lord and you answered His question. You are the Messiah. Of course, when you answer that, it's different than just ideology. It's true faith. It's the faith that says to oneself, my life is going to look different because of the Lord and what He's done for me. So many people come to faith in different ways. I told you about myself and kind of that moment of, of a flash moment. There are funny stories. C.S. Lewis was, of course, a, a, an apologetic of uh, not so long ago, basically in modernity. And many of you have read his writings. He was a great Christian author, writer, speaker, and would oftentimes do radio broadcast in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, said a lot of wonderful things. He's got great books that still, to this day, are still very well widely read, and many of his sayings are, are thought of, and he's a great thinker. But if you ever hear his story about how he came to faith, he, he basically laughs because he doesn't remember like fireworks or like an altar call moment or anything like that. He basically tells the story how he got in a sidekick car to like the motorcycle. Remember the old sidekick motorcycle cars? And he says, basically, I got in. I didn't really believe in God. Went on a drive, thought about it, got out, and I believed. <laughs> right? And so this call coming of faith, and of course you read the rest of his life and what he did with his life and how he spent it, of course he met with the Lord and was changed. But nonetheless, it doesn't always look like fireworks. It doesn't always look like great, these great huge moments of transition. But the Lord works in great ways. I remember I've, of course, done so many funerals at this point of being a pastor, but I'll never forget... Uh, one of the people in my first congregation that I served were the toad vines. Specifically, it was George and Shirley, who have now passed on to be with the Lord. But they were uh, teachers for many, many years in the school system. And they had taught and been faithfully, so faithfully and so regularly that so many of the people knew them. And they were the type of people that would go on hospital visits just to do it, just to go visit parishioners, just because. And so I'd run into them on my hospital visits. And it was so funny because all the nurses and doctors knew them. They were like, oh, you're... It's George and Shirley Toadbun, you taught me third grade. And so, like, walking down the hall, they couldn't stop. You know, you, they were constantly getting stopped by the doctors, you know, uh, remembering who they were and how the toad vines had affected their life and changed their life. But it was so telling at their, George's funeral when I went to it, the children got up and talked. And they talked about this man and his faith and his love to them, how grateful they were for him but especially the way he lived his faith. They were the type of people that had a prayer room dedicated in their house. By, it was 5.30 a.m. every morning. They were there, praying every day. Their family, for their people, and the children saw this throughout a lifetime, and they served. In fact, some of their kids became missionaries around the world and did many great things. But as they talked about this faith, it was clear that at a very young age, they knew the answer to Jesus' question. Don't know how your faith journey looks. It doesn't really matter in the sense of how, how different it looks. But Jesus asks us this question in so many different ways. So don't get tied down to what I'm trying to say is a moment, right? That you don't have this moment that stands out in your brain. But that moment right now, you know in your heart. Jesus looks at you and asks you that question. You know the answer. The question for us is the answer we give. Do we live like it? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for the challenge. And God, if we're honest with ourselves, we fall short in so many ways. But Lord, we believe you're the master of the universe, that you are the God who has loved us beyond even our wildest imaginations. And yet so many times, God, we don't act like it. We pursue our own self-interest. We don't love those who are in need. We don't meet the needs of those in our community, our family, or even ourselves. 
God, in so many ways, we fall short. Lord, it's your great joy to forgive us, pick us up off the ground again and knock the dust off us. Hold our hand and help us take those next steps as we continue on the journey. So Lord, as we come to your table, as we come to remember this Holy Communion, God, we do pray for ourselves that we for, we offer ourselves, Lord, that is, to you, we repent, and we ask for forgiveness. God, we look at you. We answer, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Give us strength, Lord, to live like you. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he took the bread, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of my new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, do this remembrance of me. So Lord, in these your mighty acts in Jesus and those that we have named here today, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you in union with your offering for us. God, may you bless these elements wherever they may be. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that in taking them we may become more like you, be the body of Christ broken for this world. Father God, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours now and forever. Amen. People of God, the body of Christ is broken for you. We do this in remembrance of him. The blood of the new covenant put out for many for the forgiveness of sin. We drink this in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for proving your love toward us again. 